Welcome, everybody. So today's panel at Y Texas Summit, our theme for today's panel is creating an innovative ecosystem. It's centered around the Texoma Innovation Development Engine's mission. We are honored to have leaders of the participating institutions on this panel. Because their guidance and commitment are integral to our shared goal, our objective with the developmental engine is to create a logistics innovation ecosystem by collaborating, innovating, and educating in the fields of automation, cybersecurity, electrification, workforce development. Through a series of workshops, site visits, conferences, and marketing efforts, Dallas College, in partnership with these esteemed institutions, is dedicated to creating an inclusive, innovative ecosystem that transforms North Central Texas and South Oklahoma's logistic industry. Join us as we share insights, best practices, and the vision of a prosperous future. I am your moderator for the next 45 minutes to an hour. My name is Lakeisha Raynard. I am the Director of Workforce Development and Apprenticeships Relationship Management at Dallas College. As well as a co-principal investigator, Workforce Council lead for the project, and might I say, the number one Dallas Cowboys super fan. So today I feel like I have died and gone to Cowboys heaven. Today's panel features a group of trailblazers who are at the heart of Texoma Innovation Developmental Engine, shaping its goals and driving its initiatives. These individuals are not only experts in their respective fields, but also champions of innovation and economic growth. So it's only befitting that we are under the championship banners today. Dr. Terrence Poland is a logistics professor and senior associate dean at the University of North Texas G. Brent Ryan College of Business. He also directs the Jim McNant Institute for Logistics Research and co-directs the Center for Integrated Intelligent Mobility Systems. Wave for us, Dr. Poland. Dr. Khaled Abdelghani is a professor at the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering and fellow at the Stephanie and Hunter Hunt Institute for Engineering and Humanity of Southern Methodist University. Can you wave for us, Khaled? Michael Gaffney is the director of Aviation Sciences Institute at Southern Oklahoma, Southeastern Oklahoma State University in Durant, Oklahoma, and serves as the Industry Educator Forum Co-Chair at AABI. Wave for us, Michael. And last but not least, we have Eric Griffin. He serves as the Vice President of the Dallas Regional Chamber. Can we applaud our speakers and our panelists for today? So today we will delve into the core of the Texoma Innovation Developmental Engine, exploring its mission, objectives, and the impact it promises to bring to our region. Our panelists will provide valuable insights and in logistics innovation, autonomous systems, regional economic growth, and future of the logistics supply chain. Their expertise will shed light on key questions that will help us understand the significance of this initiative for economic growth, research, and higher education. Please join me again in giving a warm welcome to our distinguished panel members. So we have a list of questions that we want to ask on today. And then at the conclusion, we want to see if there's any audience uh, questions that may come about. So I'll give our first question over to Terry. Terry, why did the development of engine team choose logistics innovation as its area of focus? 
Well, when we were putting together the proposal, we knew it was going to be very competitive. We were one of only 40 proposals accepted out of 700 submissions from across the country. So first of all, we knew we had to differentiate. When you think of DFW, it's a major logistics hub. We're the fourth largest freight market in the United States. We have over 1 million square feet of industrial real estate in this uh, market. Think of 36 square miles under roof just for distribution. We have three class one railroads. We have DFW Airport. Clearly, we can differentiate ourselves from other markets in the country. But also, we can focus on a specific area that's of national importance. As many of us saw during the COVID pandemic, there were many supply chain issues that emerged. So we could address a topic that was not only relevant, but affects everybody's standard of living, affects our ability to compete as a nation. And then lastly, what it also allows us to do is focus on an area that's ripe for cultural innovation. When you think of how we've been doing business for the last couple of decades, we drive trucks, we move trains, we fly airplanes. We are ready right now to transform how we do logistics in the United States. We're bringing on autonomous vehicles, both air, ground, and robots in many distribution centers. We're bringing on technology that will allow us to manage logistics operations from source of supply to the end retail store in real time and having that kind of visibility. So there's going to be major changes that are going to be occurring in many of these companies, as well as in the workforce that's needed to support that in the future. So at this critical point in time, it's great to be putting together an ecosystem that focuses on this area. And I believe that's why the National Science Foundation selected our proposal. Now, Terry, you just mentioned an ecosystem. Can you explain what is meant by a logistics innovation ecosystem? Well, what we're trying to do and what in the stage we're in right now with the engine is to bring together all of the critical stakeholders. I see people from Workforce Solutions here, very critical piece and they're a major collaborator within our engine because we've got to prepare, as we bring forward these new innovations, these new concepts, we need to have a workforce that's upskilled to support those innovations. So we have the workforce component. We have the corporations that are involved in logistics, some of them being uh, logistics companies like a UPS, a FedEx, a Southwest Airlines. But it also involves companies that move freight, like a PepsiCo or a Walmart. So we need them as stakeholders. We need government um, organizations because often, when we look at how we move goods in an area, it's affected by the infrastructure that we have. We also want to bring university researchers into play, entrepreneurs, venture capitalists. So when we look at an ecosystem, we're trying to bring together all of these stakeholders focused on use-inspired research. In other words, what are the needs of industry? So we have industry, stakeholders, governments, we have to bring all of these together. And what we're trying to do is create a culture of innovation. So one key stakeholder I failed to mention was K through 12. We want to uh, drive innovation down to that level focused on logistics where students come out and it's cool to innovate, come up with new ideas and then try and implement them. And that's what we want to do. And also with an ecosystem, we leverage each other's capabilities. Now, with these ecosystems, once you start bringing entrepreneurs together, they feed off of each other. And that's what we've seen in areas like Silicon Valley and even in Austin, Texas. And it raises the standard of living for the community. So this ecosystem is much broader than just doing research. It's a community effort. Awesome. So, Ari. Uh, he was talking about what we were doing as far as the area is concerned. Talk about the importance of logistics industry to the regional economy and how you expect the Texoma engine will impact the industry. Yeah, thank you, Lakeisha, for the question. That's a, a very good one. Um, I can really only address what's happening in the Dallas region with my comments, but I'm going to note that the entire Texoma region shares many of the same economic and demographic characteristics. So whatever numbers you hear me talk about, just think in addition to, there's more. 
So the logistics industry is subsumed under a larger super sector, industry super sector, trade, transportation, and utilities. And in the Dallas-Fort Worth uh, metroplex, there's about 900,000 people employed in that super sector. That's an enormous part of our workforce. It represents more than a fifth of all the jobs in the area. In fact, logistics and, and trade transportation utilities represents just under a fifth of all businesses in the area. So we're talking about a large contributor to the regional economy and the health of the, of the area. Now, if you look at DFW as an entity, we have about 8 million people, which is almost 26% of the state's population. But we produce much more than our capacity. We produce about 29% of total output in the state. So we're, we're producing about 60 billion more than you would expect just based on population alone. And a lot of that is due to our prominence in logistics and, and manufacturing, so much so that we are the sixth largest metro exporter in the country. So as one of the top 10 export markets in the U.S., it's interesting to note that we are the only one that's not on a navigable body of water. And that's very important because it really has to do with our central location and also the investment that local leaders have made in critical assets over the last several decades, including, as Dr. Pol uh, Pollan mentioned, DFW Airport, Love Field, Perot Field, and the Alliance Development in general, Alliance Texas done by Hillwood, the Southern Dallas County uh, Inland Port, which is a huge boon to free trade in the United States. And then also we have our BNSF and UP intermodal uh, uh, transit areas. And we don't even talk about the importance of our four interstate highways that flow through this region and our status as a major node on the US MCA uh, corridor. Now, our geography is immutable. We're not going anywhere anytime soon. So I would say that our, our central location and our, our prominence as having a, a current infrastructure geared towards logistics is going to keep us as a top 10, uh, as a top contender in the logistics industry for the foreseeable future. But the investments like those proposed by what we're trying to accomplish here through the Texoma engine can really expand logistics employment and businesses and drive further GDP and export growth in the future. That's why we're so interested in it. But the Texoma engine can also lead to innovations that impact other segments of the economy, not just within logistics. So we haven't talked about our pillars of work yet. We have electrification, automation, and privacy and cybersecurity. So just looking at electri electrification solutions alone, those solutions will have applicability to the, the broader commercial real estate community and also to non-logistics related fleets. If you look at automation, innovations in that area could easily have spillover impacts on, for instance, let's say healthcare industry processes. And then for privacy security innovations, that may be of interest to industries like the financial industry that's, that's built on security and privacy. So just the impacts that we're trying to accomplish as a consortium alone are, are deep within the logistics industry, but you can see that there's also broad impacts that we might expect across all industries in the economy. So I would be remiss if I didn't bring up the Red River rivalry uh, that's coming on with the Texas OU. So across the river, we have our southeastern Oklahoma friends who are also participating. So Michael, I'm glad that we're collaborating in this instance. Uh, what should we expect on a technology timeline for some of these innovations? to appear in both the Metroplex as well as rural areas of Texoma? Lakeisha, thank you. That's a very good question. As we look at uh, the way the technology is uh, evolving, uh, the linear uh, expectation of technology is accelerating. So we see artificial intelligence, we see autonomous drones, we see uh, research areas all over the, the place. The question is, when will it make its way into society, into common use, and when will it actually have its impact on the logistics and the supply chain that uh, is so uh, prominent within the Dallas area, as uh, Eric had talked about. So w what we have to do is we have to look at it in terms of time slices and look at it in five and 10 year chunks. So. Uh, we're not going to be making huge leaps into robotics and, uh, and autonomous vehicles, let's say, within five years. 
uh, but we're going to see it in certain industry sectors where it makes sense. We're going to see it uh, in uh, defense circles first. That's where these hydrogen superhighways, this, that's where some of these advanced technologies will first be uh, tested. They'll be tested in uh, areas by NASA um, and by uh, SpaceX. And then you're going to see it start working its way back into uh, transportation networks. It'll start in uh, cargo delivery, uh, cargo aircraft. We'll see it probably within uh, five to seven years. We're going to start seeing uh, cargo deliveries. Uh, we're going to start seeing drone uh, use when we start looking at uh, what's going on out in uh, across the Red River in uh, areas like the uh, Choctaw Nation uh, of Oklahoma. Um, there's an ad advanced uh, research going on out there, an application about how drone uh, and uh, autonomous vehicles can support uh, the rural areas uh, within the Choctaw Nation. And that is got the attention of the uh, Federal Aviation Administration, uh, as well as uh, the National Science Foundation and other major funding organizations because of the advanced nature. And so the Choctaw Nation is part of the collaboration with this group that you see here. And we, we meet every single week and talk about these timelines and when this technology will actually start being rolled out uh, and when it will start uh, uh, impacting uh, the way that we live and the way that we work. Uh, you gave me a good segue when you started talking about autonomous vehicles. And with the autonomous vehicle behind me and my uh, my experience in riding in one in Austin, uh, Khaled, how does the use of autonomous vehicles and systems transform logistics operations? Uh, thank you, Lakisha. This is a very good question. So. If we think about like autonomous vehicle and how it's gonna transform the, lo the logistic industry, I can think of like multiple aspects. The first one is gonna be more efficiency, right? Reducing the cost for the logistics and the industries and businesses. So uh, now we're gonna reduce the cost of, of drivers. We're gonna reduce the cost of operators in warehouses when we replace we replace them by robots, for example. So we're going to see a good amount of reduction in the cost of the operation, right, for, for logistics. Uh, another, another important uh, aspect related also to the efficiency is that logistic companies and the businesses can now extend their operation 24 hours 7. Because like if you have a driver driving a truck, this driver maybe can work for only eight hours. But now if this truck drive itself, or if you have a robot working in a, in a warehouse, so you can, you can continue operation 24 hours 7 without need to stop. So this is what extend the, the operation for logistics, which make it more efficient. Another important aspect is safety, right? Because we know that there is a human error in driving a car in uh, maybe like uh, moving moving equipment in a warehouse moving any anything there is a human error so by excluding autonomous vehicles hopefully after they mature and robots and the drones all these technologies will mature they have significant uh, improve uh, impact on safety uh, by eliminating the human error. This is what we call the human error. A driver could get fatigued on while being behind the wheel, but a robot will not get fatigued when be driving behind the wheel for long hours. So they're gonna be also a uh, big impact on, on safety. The third, the third impact, which we also like uh, try to quantify, also, is related to improve the capacity. So those trucks, or vehicles in general, because they are autonomous, they can drive with short headways. So now the lane of the road can carry more of them, right? Right now when we drive, we like to leave distance be, uh, between us and the vehicle in front of us. But if this kind of like a robots, we can squeeze many of them in, 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 in the lane. So this is improve the capacity of, of, of the highway. So this is gonna be a, a big, the last one also, they're gonna be impact on the environmental sustainability because like uh, there is uh, what we call like a speed harmonization. You can bring all these trucks together harmonize their speed, they move like as a platoon together, right? So this is like you bring a truck behind the truck, behind truck, so that the, the resistance that you get from the air 
is much less. When you put all these trucks as a train, they move as a train, so this will reduce the fuel consumption. Of course, it will reduce the amount of emission. So we also see some impact on environmental sustainability. So to summarize, it could be efficiency, they could be like uh, safety, they could be environmental sustainability, and finally enhancing the capacity of the system. Awesome. So Terry, the whole point of today's event is about building uh, up Texas and about those who may be interested in relocating. Um, why is this initiative important to companies considering relocating to the region? Well, you, going back to many of the points that Eric even made, just locating in this region puts you at the forefront of logistics practice in the country. But the key thing is, as companies start locating here and they start working with us in the innovation engine, they're going to get exposed to new ideas, new concepts, new ways of doing business and logistics, just like uh, Kala just mentioned. With this transformation, we're going to see logistics done in whole new ways. And so they're going to be exposed to that. They're going to be able to work with these entrepreneurs, take advantage of these new opportunities and leverage those other entrepreneurs that are already located in the area. But as we go forward with the engine, we're going to be locating, working very closely with the educational institutions like K through 12, our community colleges, our four-year institutions, and also developing innovative educational programs, things that will really position our workers in the future to, to fill these new positions. Because when you're dealing with autonomous trucks, you're dealing with autonomous drones, new skill sets are gonna be required. And we need to make sure that the people are ready for those. But the nice thing about this is, we already have a work, uh, everybody we talk to in logistics, we have a workforce shortage right now. And if we can bring these technologies to bear, Workers can be upskilled, work in higher level positions where they can qualify for higher income levels. What that means is if you're relocating here, you're gonna be having a skilled workforce already in place, plus being able to take care of, take advantage of these technologies. That leverage just keep, continues to build, but it also means for this area, a higher standard of living. People are gonna have better uh, jobs, higher skill jobs. But another piece of this that we don't want to ignore is with the technologies that we're gonna be put in place, people are gonna have greater access to the work environment. They're gonna be able to travel. Maybe some of them can't afford a car right now. We'll have autonomous vehicles that could pick them up. The other thing is we wanna make sure there's equitable access. So a key thing that we're gonna be very focused on is making sure that these innovations don't just benefit major corporations, they benefit the communities. But again, we want to also focus on, you know, working like with Workforce Solutions and others, coming up with innovative educational technologies, which is also very much a part of this engine. So Michael, with that said, um we have some students who are in the audience. Uh, will the current workers be able to receive the training and transitions necessary to meet the employment needs of the future innovations? That's a great question. So many of the students here today uh, that are coming through the K through 12 um, primary education system and then going on into universities are involved in robotics uh, programs, uh, aviation, uh, aviation high schools. Uh, we see that all over the place in, uh, in Texas and Oklahoma. Uh, right now in Oklahoma, there's 88 different high schools that have a four-year program in aviation that are taking students through uh, training in drones and getting their private pilot license uh, as soon as they graduate from high school. And so we see these technologies uh, proliferating throughout the K through 12. One of the things that we want in this economic engine is we want to try to create uh, innovation pockets for the K through 12 students so that we encourage them through a, a variety of uh, ways that we're working on to start coming up with the next big idea. Uh, something that they innovate in their high school, uh, in their K through 12 um, educational area, 
and then they then bring it to us and then we help them incubate that idea. So our job is to inspire and to stimulate the innovations to come out of the K through 12 areas, which is going to be really unique to this particular study. We want the, uh, the input and the innovations of the young. So we talk about that there are four engines, Eric. We talk about that there is automation, there's electrification, there's cybersecurity, and there's workforce development. Are, are there any emerging technologies that stand out as particularly meaningful uh, for achieving successful outcomes in one or more of Texoma Engine's focus areas? Yeah, you're hitting, hitting the right question on the head, and you've already heard from the esteemed colleagues up here on the panel what some of those technologies are. Off the top of my head, I can think of a few that probably are familiar to everyone. Obviously, we're talking about vehicle autonomy and robotics and battery storage technologies, blockchain technologies, advanced semiconductor manufacturing technologies. One really interesting thing is digital twinning, which you may or may not heard of, and it's essentially where we can create virtual worlds where we can run millions of simula simulations on real world conditions to try to peel underneath what might happen under certain changing conditions or even something like equipment failure expectations. So that's a really interesting technology. But an important thread that runs throughout all of those, tip those types of technologies is the application of artificial intelligence. And I'm not talking about the large language model technologies that have really taken the world by storm that we all probably are playing with in our spare time right now or maybe helping us write our papers for schoolwork right now. But <clears throat> this is machine learning and big data analysis from a different perspective that can help transform entire segments of the economy. So the technology could be a game changer across different industries, but for specifically for logistics, we've already seen things like applications for warehouse and yard management for reducing bottlenecks. For instance, there's a company right now that's using digital twinning technology to help out in situations, for instance, a truck may pull up to a yard and they're ready to pick up their load, but their particular load is six below other loads ready to be taken away. That truck is either gonna have to wait until the load is available or it's gonna have to go home empty handed. So with the digital twinning model, you can run different scenarios to find out what the best placement of different loads might be in a given situation to really reduce those occurrences and save a lot of money and be a little bit more healthy on, on the environment so you can reduce uh, idling. In the fleet management realm, we're already seeing AI being used for route optimization in real time. And that's not just once a truck picks up a load, what is the most efficient route from point A to point B, but from resource material uh, accumulation all the way through final product delivery, what's the most efficient mode of transportation, whether it's shipping by boat or airplane or rail or, or trucking. And then from supply chain transparency, just being able to know like a, a good, uh, a bill's good of lading. So wh where is your raw material being sourced? Is it an appropriate place? All the way through final product delivery, Who's wh what's the chain of, of ownership? But I'd also like to get back to why the DRC is actually interested in getting more involved in, in grant opportunities, grant development opportunities beyond just uh, adding our name to a support letter. So we see these opportunities as a way to really get behind the curtain to find out what's happening in applied research because advances are happening so rapidly in technologies like artificial intelligence, for instance, that we're discovering new business use cases every single day that are outstripping our ability to have partnerships already ready in place. Mm -hmm. So we're, when we're partnering in consortiums like this, we get to benefit from existing university research and tie that to what our, our companies are saying they need on, on an almost real-time basis. So these grant consortium can help reduce the time for creating industry university partnerships or maybe help create partnerships that wouldn't have occurred before. So I'm glad you mentioned research. So the whole point of our uh, our grant is to do use inspired research. And it's because we're going through this by doing the research and development in this type one grant. Uh, Terry, how can university researchers and entrepreneurs work together to conduct use inspired research? And by way of that answer, can you give us an explanation of what use inspired research is? Well, let's start with what use-inspired research is. Uh, as we have discussed, there are lots of different companies located in the areas. We've seen many challenges come out of the COVID pandemic that affected our supply chains. So with use-inspired research, we're focused on work that 
companies see as their current challenges, their future challenges. So we're asking our corporate partners that are working with us, tell us what are the challenges that you see five years from now, 10 years from now, 15 years from now. Then what we will do is we will partner university researchers with entrepreneurs to try and address those specific problems. Now, with the Type 2 engine, we will be receiving funding from the National Science Foundation to fund several of those projects. So as these projects are put forth, we will put together teams that will address them in these different areas that we already have identified. And so there's going to be a search to identify all the different entrepreneurs that are out there, identify the different problems that industry is facing, and bring that together in this ecosystem. And fortunately, with the funding, we can leverage that. We can bring together venture capitalists as well to really uh, take all of these logistics problems and take them to a whole new level in terms of the capabilities we can bring to bear. So Khaled, uh, what new opportunities may be opened by logistics automation for business and industry? So for opportunities open for uh, business and industries, we can think of many opportunities. As, as I mentioned uh, in, in the previous question that uh, Lakisha asked me, they, the, these technologies will help reducing the cost, right, for, for these industries, right? And when you reduce the cost, meaning you in, in, improve profitability of the businesses. So this is one, one key factor. Another key factor also, the technology, as I said also, it will help these companies improve safety and compliance. Right, because we are we are taking the worker from dangerous tasks, right, and they give it to machine. So this will help the companies improve safety in any in all their operations and all the tasks, and also making sure that they are they they, they comply to to uh, to uh, to laws and to uh, uh, requirements, uh, work 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 environment requirements. Another, another uh, important uh, benefits that happen to the, indu the industries and businesses is that with these autonomous technologies, they can reach out to rural and uh, remote communities. Right, so this is, could be another value, but right now the market is limited maybe in urban areas. With this autonomous technology, they can go far, reach more community. Another benefit that I think of is that there are going to be great opportunities for these companies to do what we call customization and personalization. So you can offer, say, for example, you need that product at 10 p.m. tonight. They will be able to deliver that product for you at, at, at 10 p.m. tonight, not, wa not waiting for next day in the morning when the regular truck have to, to go to inside your neighborhood. So this is what we mean by personalization and, uh, and uh, uh, providing like personal service to individuals. Uh, what else I think of? There could be also uh, more opportunity to create like resilient business so in case of like disasters in case of like uh, natural disaster hurricane this business is still doesn't need to be disrupted for a long time it can return it back so quick after after that disaster so these technologies also will help those business to be like more resilient right in terms of coming back to business in very short time so Michael uh, you talked about that there is going to be change that's going to be happening. And I feel, feel like the whole panel has really been talking about how things can change. Why do you think we need to change anything in terms of the way we currently do business? Well, that's a good question. And that really just gets back to the natural evolution of humankind. Um, human, uh, humans are innovators and uh, our society is... Um, we're surrounded by people that are entrepreneurs and intrapreneurs constantly looking at research areas. And when the investors and venture capitalists and um, get together with a good idea, that leads to technology that's going to work its way into the market. So we know that technology is going to be coming. We just have to look over the last 100 years and look at the evolution of technology uh, in aviation and space and in computer technology. So we know that these things are coming. We know that uh, there's a huge uh, innovations coming in healthcare. And so this particular 
effort is, is focused on the innovations coming in the distribution network. Um, so when you look at uh, a given company, let's just take Walmart, for, uh, for instance. So let their product comes into um, a uh, distribution center, comes into, let's say, a port, moves to a distribution center, moves to a local warehouse, moves to a store, and then somehow or other that product has got to move to the consumer's home. And so Walmart, Amazon, all of these big retailers target, they're all, they're all looking at ways of how do you tighten the time, how do you increase the efficiency, as Khaled had talked about, uh, how do you tighten up the efficiency of that delivery chain? And so uh, these uh, innovations are going to naturally come um, uh, just with the way that uh, society is evolving. And so these create great work, uh, workforce uh, evolutionary opportunities for us, especially for the young. Um, when you have people, uh, when we have students in junior high and high school doing robotics, doing artificial intelligence research, doing uh, a drone uh, technology research, they're already inspired with the use of that technology and how that's going to affect them in the workforce. So we see these workforce uh, uh, opportunities um, and we see that the technology is going to come. The question is, are we going to embrace it or are we going to push back on it? So Terry, uh, how will community input, feedback and workforce needs be addressed in the engine? Well, what we'll be doing is, you know, especially working with our collaborators, but we'll be having a variety of different forums in the area where we want to obtain community input. You know, like, for example, how will putting in new technologies, let's just say in a community, affect the noise, affect congestion, affect safety, um, also emissions. We want to make sure that the solutions that we're coming up with are actually going to improve the community and raise the standard of living. So we are hosting a variety of different events, we, even this one here today. We want to hear from you. What matters to you? How can we improve what you're seeing in your local community? Like some of you may say, I don't want to see 10 delivery trucks showing up every day. I don't want a fifth wheeler driving through my neighborhood. Okay, so let's try and find innovations and solutions that will address those. So we're gonna have a variety of forums where we're gonna be seeking input from you directly, also from your community leaders. We also have a variety of collaborators here that we want their input as well to help guide us in determining what innovation should be um, prioritized. On the workforce side, Yes, we're looking to our, our friends in Workforce Solutions. Tell us what you see as the needs. What kind of educational programs need to be funded and supported? And let's tie those and make sure that they also link to these future needs that we're hearing from these different companies. And the one thing that I do have to really uh, uh, praise the people at Workforce Solutions, they're already looking far ahead into the future. So we want to learn from you as well. What do you see? What are you hearing? and bring that to the table. So we're gonna have these types of forums, but we want people to be directly collaborating with us, be partnering with us, tell us what you see, making sure we're prioritizing the right research. So it, when we talk about creating this ecosystem, it's not somebody in a small group making the decisions, it's the entire group all together setting the prioritization, setting the direction of where we go and we need that input because we're also very concerned about satisfying the needs of the community. We want people to have access. We want people to equitably benefit from this. And we want to be as inclusive as possible to uh, incorporate all the different inputs from these different areas. Excellent, excellent. So uh, before Eric, you talked about the, that Dallas Regional Chamber wants to be involved in things that they're not just a collaborator on. How does the participation in the NSF TIP Engine Developmental Grant Award align with Dallas Regional Chamber's mission? Thank you so much for that question, Terry. You really set me up for that with the comments that he just made. Uh, if I'm going to talk about alignment with the Texoma Engine with the Dallas Regional Chamber's mission, maybe I should tell you just a tiny bit about our mission. I won't make this a big commercial for the Chamber, but 
essentially all that we've talked about fit into that mission, which is essentially to lead the Dallas region to become the best place in the U.S. for all people to live, work, and do business. And we do that by helping out d- develop sound public policy, uh, engaging communities to ensure inclusive economic development, helping to develop and attract talent to grow our, our healthy workforce for many years into the future. And we do the, all that in order to pr- promote economic development and prosperity in the region. Now, the TIP engine program seems tailor-made to further the DRC's mission and goals, so it was really an easy sell to, to join the Texoma engine. For example, our public policy team may find themselves and have already found themselves advocating on behalf of the needs of our autonomous trucking members down at the state legislature when legislation that could hamper the furtherance of that industry got proposed. We had to be there to speak in opposition to that. Our diversity, inclusion, and community engagement team can definitely help advise on addressing what we haven't spoken about yet. The National Science Foundation designates innovation deserts, which essentially are specific populations, whether remotely in their geography or historically underrepresented, when they aren't benefiting equitably from what we term the innovation economy. And then you've heard all of us talk about the really strong K through 12 STEM education opportunities and components of the engine, as well as a very strong economic development uh, uh, thrust that we have. And with the promise of, of attracting a skilled workforce and really highly qualified researchers to the region, this fulfills our goals for the education talent and workforce team that we maintain. And then from an economic development standpoint, Transforming an industry that already has an outsized impact and contributes so much to the regional economy, like the logistics industry, that's in, important in and of itself. But as I talked about a little earlier, supply chain is important for all industries. And the advancements achieved by our engine that we're proposing can help the DRC recruit businesses from all stripes. And, and in addition, there's supply networks. We already have a pretty good profile when it comes to a broad and diverse economy. We want to maintain that throughout the next several decades. And then finally, the National Science Foundation's emphasis on technology transfer and commercialization can really help our region strengthen the entrepreneurial community and ecosystem that Terry referred to and attract additional venture capital dollars. So to to use a highly uh, technical economic development term, this engine really dings all the bells for the the chamber, and it it just makes sense for us to be much more than a a sign-on and actually be helping develop the, the trajectory. We're so happy for the collaboration. So, Khaled, um, what are the near and long-term opportunities for advancing autonomy systems in the logistics enterprise? The, the near term, I think, is start, we start seeing it already, right? Like, if you look at the, the companies around us here, like uh, areas like uh, last mile delivery, right? The technology is already there to, to solve the last mile delivery problem. Uh, we see also like uh, automated warehouses. So most of them large, large companies like Walmart, Target, uh, Amazon, all these companies now making sure that they automate the operation of their warehouses and the technology there and they use it. Uh, another important uh, near-term technology that we're seeing, like rolling out very fast, is the AI-powered, we call it the AI-powered uh, logistics ecosystem. So every deci- every decision that we make in the logistic ecosystem from from the a product like it is manufacturing in a factory till it goes to us in our homes, there is many decisions need to be made, right? So we see like the use of AI in making those decisions. So a lot of companies now is collecting data and uh, developing AI systems that can help making this decision in a in a more efficient and, and optimal way. And these systems, of course, are going to be very valuable for like fleet management, as Eric mentioned, could be for inventory management. So we see all of these kind of like big data and AI systems going to really power the, the, the decisions that we make in the logistics ecosystem. For the long term, I would see like... Uh, you see, autonomous trucks will come, right? It's still like slow, but it will come maybe in the next five to ten years. So we see some experiments happen here in Texas, but like it is not like uh, ready yet. But I expect that from five to ten years, we'll start seeing trucks that drive themselves between big, big urban centers. Another important technology that also considered to be in the long term a little bit, which is the use of the 
blockchain technology. So blockchain is very important for the logistics. It has a lot of application, like in terms of making sure of transparency, making sure of preventing of uh, frauds, uh, ensuring the, uh, uh, that all the products that move from place to place are authentic products. So this technology also will start to be adopted in, in the logistic technology in the next 10 years or so. I hear a lot about what we're trying to do right now, and we've kind of gone over how it will impact, but what is the goal or outcome of the TIP1 engine planning effort? Well, you've heard a lot of discussion about all the things that are possible. What we're doing is we're putting a plan together about how we're going to make this ecosystem evolve, how it's going to develop, how it's going to work. If we're successful in our plan, the National Science Foundation will fund us for up to $16 million a year for 10 years. We can use that to leverage venture capital, money from corporations to field these um, innovations. So this can be a huge uh, point of leverage for advancing logistics innovations in the area. But to get there, to write a plan like that, it takes your involvement. We need you to be telling us, what are the needs? What are the things that you see? What are your concerns? Is it safety? Is it emissions? Is it noise? We need your input. We need to reach out to entrepreneurs, understand what are their challenges in bringing their ideas to market. We need to reach out to researchers at the universities, and that's why we have a very unique con uh, collaboration between five educational institutions. And believe me, trying to get five educational institutions to work together as well as we have is a challenge. And so pulling all of this together and writing that plan is what we're working on right now. But again, it's not going to be successful if we don't have community engagement, if we are not addressing community needs, if we're not bringing in the entrepreneurs, the venture capitalists. It can't be just university research. So that's what we need to make this successful. So we're counting on you to participate, to join us, provide your input, and occasionally tell us how we're doing as well. So this is going to be for each of you to answer, but I'll start with Terry since he just finished. How can interested companies, organizations, or individuals participate in the developmental engine initiative and what is required? Terry, what's required for them to participate as a business or organization? Well, what we're looking for right now from corporations, what are your needs? We're looking for those, I mean, those user-inspired research topics. From all of you that may be working in workforce solutions, working in educational institutions, what are the educational challenges that we need to overcome? How do we, what are we gonna have to do differently in the future to prepare that future workforce? Be it somebody uh, coming right out of high school and going right into employment, somebody going through and getting an associate's degree, somebody getting a four-year or advanced degree. What are gonna be the things that we need to do now and into the future to prepare that workforce? And likewise, we need to understand what are the community concerns? Is it, you know, how can we address those with these innovations? It's one thing to say, hey, we're going to have autonomous trucks, but we wanna make sure they're safe they're reducing the noise, they're reducing emissions. But what are the other things that we need to pay attention to? So how can you engage us, talk to us? We'll be more than glad to engage with you directly. Go to our website, go to our universities. There are a lot of different pathways as to how you can engage. What's required? Your input. Now, Further down the road, yes, we might be talking to corporations and saying, if this is a specific need, let's talk about some funding. Let's talk about some agreements. But right now, just telling us that you want to collaborate, you want to work with us, you want to help us plan for this is what we're really seeking. So Khaled, how can those that are interested get involved with us to create that big idea you're always talking about? So 
uh, I, would, I would like to continue on what uh, Terry mentioned. Is like in universities, we know that there are two kind of like types of research that we do. The first one is what we call like fundamental or theoretical research, right? The other one is applied research, right? And this project, our project here, focusing more on applied, what we now we call use inspired research. So we are trying, like, instead of setting our labs, inventing problems, solving them, publishing them, and we'll be happy, no, we'll not be happy in that project. This project focus on solving problem for the industry. So the, the, the best way to do it is creating that interaction between us and the industry, sitting together, listening to the challenges that they face, and then showing them the capabilities that we have at the universities, right? Showing them because some industry may be like they don't know that they have this group at UNT that can do that excellent work in 5G technology. And that group at SMU, they are good, very good in artificial intelligence. And that group at Arlen that they are very good in cloud computing. So we need to educate the businesses in the region here about the capabilities of the universities and in the same time listen to the challenges that they have and try to do that match between, between real world problems and opportunities for innovation, innovative solutions for these problems. Eric, you probably touch more on the economic development and the chamber side. How can they get involved and help us with the engine? Yeah, I think it comes down to just being willing to put skin in the game. And, and I'll give a couple of examples from, let's say, a Fortune 1000 sized company perspective. It's a matter of recognizing that we have the research capacity in this region amongst many different school systems that they would find anywhere else in the country. Maybe they've been going back to their alma mater for research capacity, or they have a certain understanding of what a Harvard or a Stanford does. We have that exact same capability here. It's just a matter of being, becoming aware. Uh, for other businesses, it might be a matter of being willing to look beyond just the, their own particular needs within their corporate boundary, but being willing to work on industry-wide solutions. So being able to sit at the table with some of their competitors and say, we're doing this for the good of the industry, We'll take what we need for our company, but we're trying to get the entire industry to move forward. And then from a workforce perspective, I have a workforce background as well, and it was always challenging for working with corporations coming in saying, we can't find the talent we need. The talent you need is out there, but what we need from you is, if you can't find the talent you need, help us to develop solutions that will get your existing employee base to that level that you need. Or what does somebody outside of your organization need to get to get to the point where you're, you're filling your positions? And that may take resources. It may take funding. It may take partnerships with our community colleges. It may take partnerships with other organizations. But the people are there. There are plenty of people that are looking for a job that have the capabilities to fill those roles. But it's a matter of the company taking a lead on filling those roles in partnership and not just saying we can't find people. So this was our first event, but it's, of course, not going to be our last. So with that, Michael, I'm going to end with you. How can organizations get involved with our next conference? We have a number of uh, seminars and collaborative conferences that we have scheduled over the next two years. The next one is going to be October 27th uh, up in Durant, Oklahoma, at the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma headquarters. And... That's going to be the place where we have the outreach, where we're going to be bringing in specific speakers that are going to be talking to the various technologies that would be of interest to both the industry stakeholders and the, uh, the educational, higher educational researchers and the K-12 uh, teachers and the STEM areas. So we're going to be using these outreach areas as a way to try to reach out to not only the communities, but also the, uh, the economic development commissions like Eric represents and the other ones up and, up and down the Texoma region. So going all the way from the Dallas Metroplex all the way up into Oklahoma uh, across that Red River to try to increase the awareness and the opportunities to stimulate the business and the uh, governmental leaders of what it is that we can bring uh, to their particular regions. So, and Lakeisha, I think that announcement was an open invitation, right? That is correct. Everybody's welcome to come. 
So with that, I, I am honored uh, to be your moderator for today, but I, I want to put in a shameless plug. A shameless plug says it doesn't stop here. We want you involved in our next workshops. We want you involved in our next conferences. We want to do site visits with you. If you're a student, we want to hear from you. How can we help you to learn more about what we're going to do today? Attendees, let's explore uh, the potential for collaboration to drive economic growth in the Texoma region. Share your insights on key areas where we can make a difference. Now it's your turn to take the lead. Attendees from different sectors, Come together and leverage your strengths to contribute to the success of the NSF initiative. We are not just here to talk. We're here to take action. We need immediate steps. What immediate steps will you commit to as participants to kickstart collaborations following this event? Finally, I want to remind everyone, uh, before we conclude, I have a couple of important reminders for you. Don't forget to visit the Dallas College Exhibit Booth, where you can learn more about our ongoing initiatives and collaborations happening at Dallas College. Our team will be there to answer your questions and provide additional information. Additionally, we have exciting opportunity for you to capture a memorable moment at our 360 booth. Be sure to stop by, take a picture, and share your experience with us. It's a fun way to commemorate your participation in today's event. And finally, I would like to remind everyone about the importance of your feedback. To help us in our ongoing efforts, please take a moment to scan the QR code of those who will be walking around with business cards to complete our survey. Your insights are invaluable as we work towards fostering innovation in the, in the Texoma logistics industry. Your participation is greatly appreciated. Thank you and go Cowboys!